Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so as mentioned, I'm going to talk about Web3 gaming, NFTs, and ooh, what a glare. So I can, can't see anyone, which is probably a good thing. Anyway, uh, very quickly, for those of you who don't know, Animoca Brands is a company that's been around in the Web3 NFT space for almost six years. Uh, we've invested in over 450 projects, own companies like The Sandbox, and a third of those have been in Web3 Gaming, which is why we're very bullish about it, and also we have a vested interest in it, just declaring. But let's talk about a little bit the importance as to sort of Web3 specifically and how it relates to gaming thereafter. So first, I think you noticed already, but it's good to point out, we currently live in an environment where we're dependent on platforms in Web2, whether this be the house of Google or the order of Microsoft or whatever platform you can think of. It could be Steam, it could be Apple, it could be any of these platforms. We're completely beholden to them because essentially they control our digital lives. And we see this today when, for instance, we don't even have the ability to launch basically the kind of games that we want because they have NFTs, they would ban it, for instance. Or if you thought you had a handle on, Meta, on Instagram that had a million followers, they're not your followers. They can remove it at any time. Uh, when Elon Musk acquired Twitter and renamed it to X, the person who owned the at X handle lost it. And because he wanted to also go into the music business, the person who owned the at music handle lost it as well. Meaning that we actually don't have any rights in these digital platforms whatsoever. And this is true for gaming as well. And that's because today, the most valuable resource on earth is data. And data accrues infinite amounts of value because they have gravity, they become blocks of information, and they become knowledge. And this is true in everything that we do in Web2 today, and especially also true in gaming, which occupies the attention of billions of gamers, I'll get into that detail later, and where they're farming us for our time and attention, even though we are creating all the value for them, we don't get anything for it. In a social network context, it's like all of you who are sharing photos on Instagram, what are you getting? You're getting likes for it, but you're actually not getting any of the value, which is the, what they're generating from. So this is why Web3 is so important, because Web3 gives us the ability to own a piece of this network, to own the piece of the network that we basically help construct value in. And the key thing, what we see in the opportunity in Web3 gaming, but also in anything related to Web3, is that the share of value that is distributed across Web3 becomes more equitable, more fair. So in the Web2 model, and you take it from a game publisher standpoint, the investors, the shareholders, and the entrepreneurs, I guess, or the builders of the game studios get most of the benefit. But the creators and the users, in fact, they're the ones who create most of the value inside those networks of these games, get very, very little. But in Web3, we have the ability to actually create, give everyone a relatively equal share. I'll give some examples later on how that works. And that's why we think that's a massive opportunity. It's why there's a lot of excitement in Web3 generally, and especially in Web3 gaming. So let's talk a little bit about gaming first. So what's interesting about gaming is that unlike other industries, gaming is a digital first industry. In other words, the entire economics of gaming comes from a desire that starts from the digital platform. If we didn't have gaming, we wouldn't have Razer, we wouldn't have Nvidia, we wouldn't have AMD, we wouldn't have curved screens, we wouldn't have PlayStation, we wouldn't have Xbox. All of this hardware that you're buying today, all of these advances you see in technology, including the GPUs, actually come from gaming itself first. And today, it's a $200 billion industry, has over 3.2 billion gamers. And what's interesting about the gaming industry that most people don't really realize is that it's driven primarily by this free-to-play business model in which less than 3% of all gamers pay. So for all of you here in this room, maybe you've played games before, Chances are, and since I can't see you because the light's glaring at me, so I won't do a poll, but probably you probably haven't paid for your games. Or if you ask your friends, they haven't paid for the games. That's because most of us never pay for the games. What we actually do is we become essentially like the entertainment for the people who play the games. So imagine you're playing something like Fortnite and you enter the world of Fortnite and there's nobody to shoot at. Well, then you wouldn't pay for it, for instance. So all the free players are basically entertainment. And that brings it forward to this 1% to 3% sort of player conversion rate that is the industry standard driving hundreds of billions of dollars a year, for instance. But the point is that actually what you can do in blockchain now is that you can see the value, meaning that if someone actually sort of induced someone to pay money in the game, you can then reward that person, which is one element in where play to earn became that possibility, one of the first examples of this. The other area of gaming is where you see value being shifted. So online advertising is one of the biggest sort of customer acquisition costs in gaming. Over $100 billion a year last year was spent in acquiring basically players into games. Where does it go to? It goes to Facebook, it goes to Google, it goes to Apple. How much do these companies put back in the gaming industry? Almost nothing. So there's a huge amount of value extraction that takes place. 
above and beyond the 30% or 15% platform fees that they take, they also charge advertising for it, meaning they take most of the value and very little comes back. But we all spend money on marketing and advertising. So what's interesting about the opportunity in Web3 Gaming as well is that it flips the advertising uh, model around. So for instance, when you think about giving out tokens, when you think about giving NFTs, sometimes even free NFTs, what you're really doing is you're spending marketing, except you're giving forward value. And the difference is that you're giving value to the gamers of the game instead of actually giving it to a platform that you have no idea who that customer is at the end of the day. Whereas with an NFT, you know who the customer is. You have an idea who he is. And if the customer doesn't like it, he'll sell the NFT. That's your marketing cost, for instance. Maybe you have to support that. But the point being that actually you have a direct relationship with the customer, which you can't do in Web2 because the customer is one that came in through Apple or through Steam or through Epic or through any one of those platforms. So essentially, that's one of the opportunities as well when you think about sort of how you grow in these sort of these free NFT campaigns and these user acquisition campaigns that you can see today. Now, one big element in gaming is true also when you think with the NFTs and PFP projects is the value of our social identity. I give this example often between a Birkin bag and a board ape. The board ape is actually more expensive than a Birkin bag. And for people in the traditional non-Web3 world, shall we say, they would often query, why is it more expensive? That doesn't make sense. I can hold the bag. But of course, we know today that actually people don't buy this expensive Birkin bag so they can put stuff in it. People also don't buy a Rolex watch to tell the time. And they don't necessarily buy a Ferrari because they want to go from point A to point B in a car. They're all part of our social identity. And the same is true for gaming. Over $100 billion was spent last year and growing in all these areas of whimsical and cosmetic items inside games. Trinkets, skins, fashion items, everything that basically make you look good in games. Essentially akin to a fashion industry, all about social identity. And just the same way that you do in the physical world as you do in the digital world is the same. You buy things for culture, for community, and for everything that stands that means your social identity. What that also means is that when you have ownership of these things, as is possible in Web3, you can now build network effects on top of them. So the way we think of it is that end users basically become the center of the experience. They become the platform in itself by owning the NFTs, by owning these digital items. It means that you have, if you have a game item, you can use it in one game, two game, three games. You can use it in a DeFi protocol. You can have lending, you have mortgages on it. You can have these infinite amounts of network effects that people can build independently on top of it give you sort of a hypothetical example. Imagine if Fortnite was actually going to have skins that were on chain. How many other game developers in the world are actually going to start making games that utilize their skins? We think almost everyone, because Fortnite has 70 million users that own these skins. They're addressable customers that you can go after. This, by the way, is how the real world works. The fact that we have ownership of cars in a decentralized manner is the reason why we can buy baby seats, we can hire drivers, we can have Uber, we can have Lyft, we can have all of these industries because they don't need to seek permission from the car developer or the car manufacturer to basically build services on top of it. That's not true in Web2. But in Web3 Gaming, for instance, with ownership of these NFTs, you're now able to do that, which means that we should be expecting more experiences to be built on top of the games of others because these assets basically become user-centric. And we see this experience happening in things like the sandbox, where people are building land. But also one of the criticisms has been that, well, our Web3 games, fun to play with, it takes a long time to make games. Some of the biggest games take five to seven years to make. Some of the more sort of, you know, recent games, three to four years. So these experiences will develop and many of this funding took place earlier are now starting to come out. So you see experiences like the sandbox, games like Phantom Galax Galaxies, which is basically getting closer to sort of AAA quality. But also the business models in Web3 Gaming is changing as well, where, for instance, some of the games give out 50% of the revenue share between owners of the NFTs and people who rent these NFTs. And you see this model also earlier with Axie Infinity with the Guild model, or most recently with things like Pixels. And of course, you have games in the hyper-casual segment as well that are helping onboard more users basically into, into Web3 through different platforms, say, like Telegram. All of the examples I'm giving you have all been done before in Web2. Whether this is Candy Crush, like Gamey, whether this is something like, you know, like Star Wars games, Phantom Galaxies, whether this is Minecraft or Roblox for, for, for Sandbox, there's actually not that much of a difference between in terms of the game type. But the innovation and the change comes from the fact that we have digital property rights, meaning that now you have the ability to do new things 
from the meta layer of the game, because now you go from what used to be company-owned platforms that are centrally owned to community-owned platforms, because you either own your NFTs, or they own your tokens, or they own some element in which they have government go governance. So in other words, maybe it's not that different if you play Sandbox from Roblox or Minecraft, except now it's owned by the community and governed by the community. And they have ownership of this rather than just simply being a customer from being extracted from. That means we're moving from a form of, I guess, classic shareholder capitalism into actually one that is a stakeholder form of capitalism, meaning that now gamers themselves have a stake in the games that they play with, not just simply being a consumer to be extracted from. So outside of the bearish, so bullish case in terms of what's happening in gaming, I would also say that there's other areas of funding that you can get from gaming as well. So one of the big sources is DAOs. Today, there's $20 billion actually locked in value in these DAOs. An example would be like ApeCoin, which is about $1.7 billion. And you can actually go and apply for your game fine projects that you're trying to develop. And the amount of value that's in these DAOs is actually greater than many VCs put together, for instance. So the difference, though, is that rather than appealing to a VC or to an investor, you have to appeal to the community. You have to explain to them why your game is something interesting for the community, for instance, and why you would develop on top of that. Point being, uh, point being that uh, this is obviously uh, an opportunity for anyone who's looking to raise funding for games or looking to ex sort of begin to build to a community of people by simply addressing these DAOs, which before, again, were centralized, and now you can address many of these communities. Now, quickly on the macro, NFT sales are now approaching close to a billion dollars again in the last 30 or 60 days, which is a nice setup for 2024. We think that number will grow, especially as more of these quality games come out. Many of the Web3 gaming projects that have been invested in in the last couple of years, which are in the billions of dollars, actually are all releasing in the next 12 or so months, meaning that we should expect to see a high quality, sort of a number of very high quality games coming out to market, which has sort of the added network effect that we see, uh, meaning that game companies who have, um, you know, like what we saw with Axie Infinity, when a large number of game companies, a uh, sort of large number of gamers come into these games, games that are being developed in Web3, these gamers distribute to other games as well. So in other words, they don't just become centralized playing the one game, they have portability because they can either move their assets or move their value around. So, web th so in some ways, the success of one game is actually the success of all games. Um, a few things just to close. NFTs are really gaining ground in Asia. So if you're living in the US and to some extent in, 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 in um, Europe, uh, you might feel a little bit down on Web3 gaming. Most of your friends might not like it. When you listen to the media, it's negative. But in Asia, it's quite the opposite. There's, in fact, even a GameFi index fund that's listed on Bloomberg, which basically is the beginning of a GameFi ETF, uh, sort of, you know, out of, out of, out of Hong Kong. Um, regulation is friendly. Uh, so tokens like SAN and AXS uh, and ApeCoin, for instance, are sort of tokens that you can actually buy and sort of, uh, you know, in retail, in an approved manner, for instance. Major events that have taken place uh, in comparison to the US, basically, where people often don't like NFTs. And I sort of want to just lay some thoughts around this, because why is it that gamers hate NFTs so much in the US in comparison to Asia or maybe the Middle East? And I think a big part has to do with the perspectives of capitalism. Um, I won't go into too much details here, but in general, capitalism has been become a negative force in the US. A lot of people who play games, young Americans generally, are more positive towards socialist ideas than negative, as sort of capitalist, um, meaning that, of course, that has been the party politics between the Democratic and the Republican parties. And so I think that's one element there where in Asia, in contrast, capitalism has been viewed very positively because over the last 30, 40 years, they didn't have property rights. They didn't own anything. There was a living memory. My parents could have their property taken away at any given time. But if you were living in the US, for instance, or even in Europe, actually your property was secured. It didn't really matter because generally speaking, you were safe from this and you never really knew a time in which you didn't have property. But the thing is that in over the last 20, 30 years, basically the, the kids of today or the younger generation of today are making less money on a real, real money terms than what their parents were doing. And so that has given this effect where when you enter basically in this world of gaming that actually is more meritocratic and more fair as it were, and then you introduce money people fear that. And so the responses you see for, for Web3 gamers or gamers in the US about Web3 gaming is one that's more based on fear and emotions rather than actually something that's logical. The challenge and the opportunity is that right now we have a scenario where you have a growing Web3 community, but not all of them are gamers. And you have a large number of gamers, the 3.2 billion that I mentioned before, who are not into Web3. And the intersection between the two, this chart makes it a little, little bigger. It's actually not that big. It's actually very small at this moment in time. But there's an opportunity to expand that. 
And we think the solution to expanding that and the opportunity to make this market grow even faster is not necessarily just a technological one. We often talk about how it's difficult to onboard people. You know, they need to sort of, you know, get around this issue of MetaMask. And we agree that onboarding technically is something that we need to improve on. But the big thing that we've learned, at least so far, because we've onboarded millions of people from Web2 to Web3, comes down to financial literacy. Meaning that the difference between a Web3 user and a Web2 user is that a Web3 user does understand money. He doesn't have to be an expert, but he has an appreciation of it. He thinks of what he does as an investment. He has an idea of money and value. Everyone who, does, who is in Web3 and blockchain, whether it's tokens or whatever it is, has a lens in that perspective, where the majority of the world actually doesn't do that, and especially the gamers. They don't understand value. So when they move on to Web3, we can give them a wallet, but they don't know what to do with it. They don't seem to care for it. They don't understand it. It's not even about whether it's material. It's about whether they respect that value and whether they appreciate it. Even though they think they should have ownership, they don't actually understand its, um, its implications. So we think one of the great opportunities for Web3 gaming isn't, to, first of all, not just to bring people from Web2 to Web3, is to introduce financial literacy, but that we generally should be able to actually make the world more financially literate through games overall with real money terms, which is what Web3 can do. If we can teach our children algebra, and math, then we can teach them compound interest. We can teach them about value. We can teach them about certain things that we should be doing in school. And if we can make them become financially literate, then we think we can make a big contribution to the world. Thank you.